are uh, going to start uh, the second session of uh, the conference. I just want to present the chair of the, this, uh, this session, Dr. Shlomit Yanitsky Ravid. Dr. Shlomit Yanitsky Ravid uh, is a senior lecturer at Tono uh, Law School. From uh, 2011, she is affiliated with the Yellow School, starting as a postdoctorate and being a professor fellow at the ICP, I, ISP. She has conducted two seminars at Yellow School, one of them, Law and Society in Israel, Contemporary Issues. She was giving lectures at Harvard, Columbia University, and Lausanne University. She has, visit, she has been a visiting professor at Fordham Law. She published a lot of uh, and uh, she published a lot, and yesterday she was told the uh, last article about privacy at workplace and uh, the balloon theory was chosen as one of the best articles published uh, last year in the US uh, in the entertainment field and will be uh, reprint in a book. Yeah. <laughs> she is the founder and director of Shalom Comparative Legal Research Centers and Shlomit. Okay, so first I would like to thank everyone uh, first for organizing this very interesting so far uh, conference and for my, yeah, my friends coming <laughs> from so far away and my colleagues from Columbia University and others and for the Israeli speakers and the audience. Um, thank you, I know organizing a conference is not an easy thing so uh, Dr. Elad Finkelstein and our Dean, Amichai Cohen, yeah, and Judy Arad, of course. We really appreciate what you're doing. Um, so um, we, we will have three distinguished guests in this panel. Uh, Justice Dalia Dorner from the Israeli Supreme Court, Professor Richard Brooks, which I know, who I know from Yellow School, but now I have to present him as from Columbia University. Uh, and uh, Dr. Gersh Gersh Gershon uh, Gottenwick uh, from, uh, from the legal uh, practice. So we have like the court and the uh, theory, the university, and one representative of the, of the legal practice. I think it's going to be very interesting. Um, here you can see, uh, so you are yeah, most welcome to join us. Uh, here you can see a picture of a family, it's a Kadan family, and, uh, and actually they are one of the most, I think, famous and thought-provoking uh, court decision made by the Israeli Supreme Court. This family is an Arab, Arabic family, um, and the Kadan case, based on the Kadan case, and this is the family who really want to join, wanted to join uh, a Jewish town called Katsil, a new... Yeah, innovative <laughs> Jewish town, and they want uh, and they want to join. They want to build their house over there, but they were refused for, for, uh, by the committee. And the land was uh, kind of like Israeli land uh, managed by Israeli authority for managing lands. And they appealed to the Supreme Court, the Israeli Supreme Court of Justice, and uh, the court said that they have the legal right uh, to join this community to join this town. It took 10 years until, until they actually get the ground. Um, I think I met uh, Mr. Kadan, I think five years ago in a conference, and he said it didn't work out because it was very interesting how, how did it go. And I thought about this, uh, this case a lot because of all these conflict between preserving a culture and having your own uh, place that you, you want to build with your own habits and being open to everyone. Uh, and uh, the conflict between public regulation and private interest. So I think it raised a lot of interesting questions that we are going to discuss here. But I thought about it uh, a, a lot while being at Woodbridge. Woodbridge is a small town uh, near New Haven, where we sp I, my family spent a couple of years because before moving back here to, uh, to Israel. And I, it was recommended to me by my colleague Alex Stein, and he said, you know what, there is one place you can live when you're going to Yellow School, which is Woodbridge, because there it's the best school around for your children. Um, so we rented a house over there, and uh, it was really nice one, very a lot of trees, you know, houses are far away from each other. But there was one thing that I, I was shocked when I was visiting my uh, five, uh, my, my, my five uh, grade um, child, 
at school, at Beecher School, over there, elementary school, and I saw no African American, no black was in the class. And the number of, I would say, I don't know how to call them, like minorities or people of color were really minuscule. And I mean, there, were n there was almost none. And I was thinking about like how in this area where everything is open and everyone can rent, and just like 15 minutes from there, it's New Haven with uh, so many diverse population as, uh, yeah, as being uh, stated by the New Haven uh, uh, um, Fire Department Supreme US Court. So, I mean, and so no legal restraint, but still the situation and social norms. And, and I thought, how, how did it happen? It has to do partially with the price of the, of the um, houses over there, partially with the, with the size of the land, because the land was really huge for each and every house. And partially because, I don't know, there was not so many others similar to, to those people I, I would thought I would see over there with, with my neighbors. Um, so the topic of housing discrimination, I think, raised tremendous amount of interesting question. Um, we are going to discuss in this panel, uh, and one of them is, does the legal system can improve the situation of house discrimination? Is that the role of the legal system to intervene? Um, did the legal system so far accomplish any accomplishment in this field? I guess it does. Um, would we face social segregation after all, like in Woodbridge, even though we have like the perfect open doors, liberal legal system, what can we do to improve it facing this reality? And when I'm thinking about this question, I'm going back to Israel with so many yeah, minorities Con with, uh, with which live in conflict with each other, like the Arab communities and the Druze, and think about the Bedouin in the Negev, which Israel created a, a, a special town, Rahat, for them. And I think about all these clashes in schools and in, in cinema and in public places. I think that's an amazing <coughs> topic to discuss. Uh, two last comments. No doubt segregation in housing block access to knowledge, ac access to culture, mobility, and like being part of, of society, like living far away and living in a center, living in, a, in an Arabic town, as opposed to living in Tel Aviv, is a diverse city or in a Jewish town like Bnei Brak. Aside from this uh, psychological harm of being excluded and not being exposed to others on an egalitarian basis. Before ten ten <laughs> yeah, turning back to and, and listening to our distinguished speakers, I would like to end with, uh, yeah, with being optimistic, as, as I am, with a new amendment to the Israeli Equal Opportunities <coughs> Law uh, on Workplaces. Um, this, this act, it's, like, it's, it's similar to the Seventh Amendment in the US, giving like open um, opportunities in regard mainly to workplaces. So we had, uh, a few months ago, we had uh, uh, legislation saying that uh, um, there, should be a, th there shouldn't be a discrimination on accepting someone to work or not promoting it or, or dismissal it or fire a person on basis of the place he lives in. So I think that's that's even make it more even more relevant uh, to this discussion uh, today. Okay. So, having said that, I would like to I'm honor and distinguish uh, to welcome one of the most important justices of the Israeli Supreme Court, uh, Dalia Dorner, Justice Dalia Dorner. Uh, she joined the Israeli Supreme Court in 1993, um, and she retired. Uh, on 2004, although her ruling or still still exists uh, with us uh, from from the time she was giving that, I think she was one of the uh, these justices who gave a lot of landmark ruling, reflecting her anti-discrimination way of thinking, her being a, a fighter, yeah, for social ju justice. I would just mention really few of them. Uh, like the El Al case, giving uh, the right for uh, El Al cabin attendant to receive plane ticket for his homosexual sexual partner. Um, she rules for the allocation of budgets 
uh, to a special education law to allow children with disabilities to integrate into ordinary edu education frame fr framework. And a very famous one uh, is uh, her ruling about uh, Alice Miller on the right of, of women to join military pilots program at the army. And since then, <coughs> we have uh, yeah, quite a few uh, girls uh, pilot in the army. So, Turner did. <laughs> 